Thank you. Always tough for the uh, immediately after lunch crowd, so hopefully, please don't fall asleep. I'll do my best to keep you entertained. Um, so, heard a lot of really exciting and interesting things here about removing carbon from the atmosphere tomorrow. And a lot of great intent about removing carbon from the atmosphere today by accelerating those technologies, accelerating the policies. But what about the carbon that we emitted over the last 200 years? That's already there. What about the carbon dioxide that we can't figure out how to stop emitting? What are we going to do about that? The carbon engineering was formed in about 2009 with the intention of solving the problem of how do you remove CO2 that's already in the atmosphere? How do you do so cost effectively? How do you do it on mass? And how do you do so in a way that, that can be located just about anywhere in the world? So I'm excited to say that we have cracked that problem um, and I'll tell you a little bit about how we're doing so. So we can produce real negative emissions by pulling CO2 directly from the atmosphere. But that's not all that our technology can be used for. So I came to this conference yesterday. To get here, I took a car, a bus at the airport, two planes, and then another bus. In the process of doing so, I saw countless planes. I saw thousands and thousands of cars. I saw various buses and trucks and school buses. Transportation is an absolutely essential part of the infrastructure we all rely on for our business today. When you talk about the impact on business of carbon, imagine the impact on business of having an inefficient transportation system of any sort. But transportation is also 20% of the emissions, uh, of CO2 emissions. And it's a real hard area to decarbonize because transportation is mobile. There's a billion cars in the world. Let's all get a brand new Tesla, $40,000, $50,000, trillion right there for us all to get a new Tesla. Having started on planes, trucks, buses, gas stations, all those kind of things. But here's another idea. Instead of electrifying everything, or maybe as well as electrifying everything, why don't you change the fuel? If the fuel is carbon neutral, the vehicle is carbon neutral. If you have a way in which that fuel can power any existing vehicle, planes, cars, trucks, buses, without any change to that vehicle, you can make every vehicle in the world carbon neutral right now. And that is the kind of non-disruptive disruption that can be easily taken up and make a m massive difference in today's world. All sounds too good to be true. Next slide, please. This is our uh, pilot plant. We're in British Columbia in Canada, um, and this is the plant that we have there. Uh, it's been capturing CO2 since 2015, uh, and it's been making fuel since the end of last year. Um, our company has been fortunate in getting investment from Bill Gates, Department of Energy, various Canadian government institutions, and we've used that to do this, uh, this pilot and this demonstration. The technology that we invented through David Keith, our founder, the real key enabler of the price point that we can get to is the fact that we use existing equipment from multiple different industries. So the front of our process is direct from the cooling tower industry, a well-established industry with equipment installed all around the world. We then use technology from the iron ore industries, from the chemical industries, from the mining industries. And by doing so, we know exactly what our technology is going to cost. Because I just phone people up and say, I'd like to buy X of your piece of equipment. How much is that going to cost? So we have a real good handle on how much our technology is. What you see there is the very front end of our process. We keep it shrouded because we're trying to collect our, uh, or protect our intellectual property. But essentially, a big fan pulls the air across a chemical solution on a, on a membrane. That chemical solution reacts and captures the CO2. It drops to the bottom. We then process the chemical solution, free the chemical, the original chemical solution, back up again, keep the CO2, and the chemical solution goes back around again in a closed loop process. That means we can run our plants 24-7 without ever having to turn them off. Uh, next one, please. So what do we do with a technology like this? This is aspirational. Uh, it's a really good mock-up. Some people even think it's a real photo. Um, this is what a very large-scale carbon capture uh, negative emission plant would look like. The only thing we need here is air, and water and a small amount of electricity. This could be located just about anywhere in the world. When you add the fuel capability to the back, we make hydrogen from water 
and we, we use renewable electricity to split the water. When you do that, you've produced a mechanism to make fuel with water, air, and electricity. And that's all. And the, the fuel is carbon neutral. So I'm going to take the CO2 that you used on your RV holiday to Wyoming last year, I'm going to capture it from the atmosphere and give you more fuel to enjoy next year's RV trip to Wyoming. Because you'd always come back here, right? It's a beautiful place. So those are the types of things we can do with our technology. Equally, we can make CO2 for EOR. We can make CO2 for negative emissions to offset what some of the larger emission technologies do today. Next one, please. So last week we made, a, sorry, two weeks ago, we made the decision that we wanted to publish our papers uh, and how we're doing this. It's an interesting decision that we made uh, and one that took a little bit of time for us to get comfort with because you're exposing for other people to comment on what you're doing. So we did that because we wanted to nail the perception. Somebody said it this morning on one of the panels, direct air capture is too expensive in the future. Too expensive, can't be done. It's not too expensive, it can be done now. It's already working. We have a technology, it's another one that uh, Julio described earlier on this morning in Switzerland. So we decided to publish, and what was amazing for me was we got picked up by 150 articles around the world. The public interest was absolutely huge. Our story got shared by 145 million people. We were number four on Reddit. My kids were hugely impressed, number four on Reddit. <laughs> My response was, what the hell's Reddit? <laughs> but we really made an impact. Since then, I've been beleaguered by calls from people interested in investing in the company. It's an interesting point. We discussed earlier on, um, we were, one of the panels was asked, what's going to make a difference here? How can, you, how can you proceed? What I discovered last week, which is a surprise to me, that telling a good story in a peer-reviewed way with credible uh, evidence of success. In today's market, I think we're on a little bit of a knife edge. There's a lot of interest in carbon capture, climate change, and fixing it. And having a good story generates a heck of a lot of interest. So for those of you emerging startup companies, I think it's well worthwhile. Next one, please. So um, we do still have some significant challenges in the business that I'm describing. First of all, sequestration. We can close the economics and sequest atmospheric CO2 right now with the policies that are already in place. But here's the problem. I can't guarantee to a financial investor, and many financial investors in the room, I can't guarantee that those policies will be in place for 10, 15 years, the amount of time required to make the payback that investors expect from their money. So the current legislation, my, my ask of anybody involved in the Q45 legislation, Try and figure out a way in which you can put some form of timeline in there. Because burying CO2 is purely a government policy. If you're just burying the CO2, nobody's going to pay to use that CO2. If it's a government policy, it's got to have a timeline. It's got to have certainty. So companies like us can raise the money required. Doesn't matter if your business case closes. If you only have two or three years of visibility because of political risk or something similar, it's a big negative. On the fuel side, the fuel that we produce, almost completely carbon neutral. So for the big oil and gas companies in the room, we are a fantastic blend stock. We are a quarter of the carbon intensity of biofuels. We have no feedstock limits. We're not running out of air. We're not running out of water. And we have no blend wall limits because we're a pure chemical composition, which makes us completely clean burning. <coughs> So the fact that we're a great blend stock and the fact that we're a really clean fuel is completely consistent with the RFS, the Renewable Fuel Standard, and California's LCFS problem. Problem is, when uh, RFS was written, nobody thought about fuel from the air. So we're not a biofuel. So right now, we don't qualify under the RFS, even though we're lower carbon intensities than all the biofuels. So we need... Uh, a regulatory environment that allows for some of the more recent technologies, and we're not the only ones. Um, there are other companies looking at making fuel out of other products other than bio. We need the RFS to be widened to allow for that. Last one. Oh, sorry, I thought there was one more slide. Um, I have to think on the fly. Um, so, 
what do I want to finish with? What I wanted to finish with is a couple of things. First of all, as a, as a sector, I think the sector has come a long way. But the sector needs to recognize that it's not all about future potential. There's a lot of these technologies that are available right now that can start making an impact. And we all need to be careful of how we speak about these technologies because yes, we haven't figured out a name for our industry yet. Yes, we haven't figured out what this huge sector is gonna be. But we can start work on solving climate change today. For us, we're a small company. We remain a small company. We have a lot of excitement and a lot of potential. But without partners, we're dead in the water. So we need partners, we need the end users of transportation to turn around and say, we want carbon neutral fuel. We want the producers of, of, of fuel today to turn around and say, we're interested in lowering our carbon intensity. We want to use our existing fuel infrastructure, all these terminals, all these gas stations, all these pipelines, and change the fuel, not everything else, because that's cheaper and it's more efficient. And finally, we need the public, everybody here, to talk about the potential of really fixing climate change and really fixing this problem. Thank you very much. Thank you.